Good morning, Mohammed. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come back. Uh, it is no surprise that this meeting is going from strength to strength. Those of us who come regularly recognize that it's a superb meeting. And it's a superb meeting because it challenges us. It goes back to the basics. And it develops, I think, a dialogue about issues that is very refreshing. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. This talk uh, was meant to be given by my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Nigel Heaton. Due to very sad circumstances, he cannot be here. Uh, he sends his best wishes, and I'm sure our thoughts and prayers are with him in this difficult time. The topic this morning is the microenvironment and the basics of portal hypertension. I'd forgotten, actually, most of this uh, when I started to prepare the talk. Uh, I really understood how intriguing it is. So the fundamental issue in this talk is the sinusoid. The sinusoid is the tiny element of the liver parenchyma where the interaction between blood uh, happens. These are the constituents of the uh, sinusoid. You have endothelial cells with a complex system of fenestrations, two very important fixed cells, Kupfer cells and hepatic stellate cells. And then we have what we call the space of dis. This is a subendothelial space which has a low, a soft matrix in the normal situation, which becomes the initial target of injury when any chronic liver disease. And there's a low density basal membrane. Now, this is a schema. Do we have a, a pointer? So the schema here at the top is the, uh, okay, it's the normal situation, the healthy situation, where you've got hepatocytes, the uh, blood flowing through it from the portal vein towards the terminal hepatic vein. You have, you see the fenestrations between the endothelial cells and the space of dis. Also represented here, I say, are the two uh, fixed uh, cells, the copper cells and the uh, stellate cells. In the disease state, the first thing that happens is that the fenestrations disappear. So you get a closed endothelium presenting a barrier to flow into the space of dis. And the second process that happens is capillarization of that space of dis, and I'll discuss that in a moment. So these are the first elements of the response to chronic injury and the first steps towards developing portal hypertension. And in the disease state, you then get a secondary response of uh, reorganization or regeneration of the parenchyma, and then the tertiary response of fibrosis. Fibrosis of the sinusoids starts with deposition of extracellular matrix or fenestration of the endothelial cells. And you get a change in the matrix within the space of dis. In the native form, in the healthy form, it's predominantly collagen one and three, presenting a relatively soft matrix which permits diffusion. But in the disease states, four and six are replaced by collagen one and three and fibronectin, increasing the density of that matrix and presenting another barrier to diffusion. And this creates both a functional and a physical impediment to the normal bidirectional flow of a plasma. The hepatic stellate cell is essentially the driver of fibrosis. In the healthy state, it's a fairly inactive cell. It is rich in vitamin A. But when it's activated, it actually loses that vitamin A. That's a characteristic of the activated stellate cell. And through a, a complex series of provoking factors and processes, it starts to promote the de development of fibrosis. And I'll talk about some of the complex issues that drive this cell itself into the active form in a few moments. But it also enhances the migration and the promotion of ex extracellular matrix deposition within the space of dis, and therefore perpetuating uh, the process that I've, of capillarization that I've described. This uh, cartoon shows the quiescent uh, hepatic stellate cell moving into the activated stellate cell, and then it, in turn, is driving myelofibrous. There are other drivers of this process. It's not entirely due to the hepatic stellate cell, 
but you also get influences from bone marrow cells and from the actual constituents, the hepatocytes and cholangiocytes of the liver parenchyma itself. Stimuli to activate the quiescent hepatocytes is a science in itself, stellate cells. The extracellular matrix I have already discussed. These also work by uh, generating a lot of pro-inflammatory pro, uh, and pro, pro fibrotic cytokines. And the science of the regulation of these cells is now very extensive in, in the literature. And finally, there is an immunological component to this uh, process. The progression of the disease is, as I said in my introduction, in terms of portal hypertension, is driven by the reorganization of the parenchyma. The parenchyma in this situation regenerates and regenerates in the form of nodules. This is the driver of portal hypertension. It is a misconception that portal hypertension is driven by fibrosis. In fact, fibrosis is only a reinforcing or a supporting mechanism. The primary mechanism is remodeling of the parenchyma. But nonetheless, fibrosis does represent a very visible marker of the progression of fibrosis and does indeed contribute to the severity and the pattern of portal hypertension. There is an entity called macronodular uh, cirrhosis, which within the parenchyma contained within the nodule, you do have normal portal tracts and you do have normal terminal venules. And that is a pattern that can be quite difficult to diagnose in the context of a liver biopsy. The final element of this disease progression is vascular. And it's vascular through the development of portal systemic shunts and vascular occlusion. And this is the driver of liver failure. This is the element that actually changes a cirrhotic liver into a failing uh, cirrhotic liver. There are four patterns of fibrosis. The first, the fibrosis links portal tract to the central uh, vein, and this is predominantly the pattern we see with autoimmune or viral hepatitis. Second pattern is where the fibrosis connects portal tracts to portal tracts, and that is predominantly in biliary disease. The third links central vein to central vein itself, and this is predominantly venous outflow obstruction. And finally, there's the pattern of perisinusoidal fibrosis within the parenchyma itself. This has been termed chicken wire fibrosis, and it is very characteristic of alcohol and non-alcohol fatty liver disease. So this is a representative uh, series of biopsies from a number of these conditions. The first is autoimmune hepatitis, and the uh, second is hepatitis C. And the second one is very classical of the pattern of micronodular uh, cirrhosis. The third is actually acute alcoholic hepatitis. So it actually shows a combination of the uh, perisinusoidal fibrosis with the other ballooning, cell ballooning characteristic of uh, acute alcoholic hepatitis. D, number four, is fatty liver disease with cirrhosis. Now, this is not totally representative, but characteristically, once you get cirrhosis in fatty liver, the fat has disappeared. This biopsy does actually capture both components of that disease. And in E, you see a very different pattern of fibrosis, the much broader bands, and this is a classical biliary cirrhosis. So the second issue in terms of portal hypertension, we've dealt with the structural issues at the sinusoidal level, the reorganization, the secondary fibrosis. But the second issue in terms of understanding portal hypertension is flow. And issues that affect blood flow uh, will also have an impact on uh, portal hypertension. So this is the end stage of the process I've talked about. It is suggested that from the very first change within the sinusoid to reaching this stage of uh, cirrhosis, it takes between 20 and 40 years to evolve. And only the latter part of that is visible to us in our uh, standard diagnostic uh, process. But this illustrates the cirrhotic liver, the splenomegaly, the varices, the very classical endpoint of portal hypertension.
And with that portal hypertension, you will get the uh, well-recognized pattern of clinical problems, varices, ascites, and encephalopathy, with all of the mechanistic changes illustrated there. So the talk-home points, I think, from this uh, short uh, overview of the sinusoid is to understand that that is where the entire process starts. And it starts much, much earlier than we recognize as a disease process. And we're relatively unable to A, recognize, but B, modify that process. Capillarization of the sinusoid is the initial uh, pathological response with loss of the uh, fenestrations. To repeat again the importance of understanding that hepatocyte regeneration and nodule formation is the driver of portal hypertension and fibrosis is the reinforcing element in that uh, process. And the hepatic cell itself is the prime driver of the pathology and is, it is the focus of a lot of uh, research and hopefully changing the biology and the biological response of the stellate cell will give us the breakthrough to allow us to stop the whole process of uh, fibrosis deposition within the liver and cure the condition of cirrhosis. Thank you. Thank you, John, uh, for that overview. You know, my, a lot of what is happening in living donor liver transplantation, and I think people who do living donor liver transplantation will understand how damaging portal hypertension is. And B, I'm sticking to this point. I think if we can explain that, uh, portal hypertension, you said, is a result more of nodular regeneration rather than fibrosis itself. Um, that's, that's interesting because we've seen that, you know, once you and I were talking about why is it in acute liver failure, I'm just going to the acute side first, that you get even small amount of regeneration and patients recover very rapidly uh, in, the, in the diffuse insult, whereas in the subacute liver failure, when you get nodular regeneration, the patients actually don't recover and remain cholestatic. Do you think that the, the portal hypertension with this nodular regeneration also causes in a very similar mechanism cholestasis when there is nodular regeneration. Why is it that in cirrhosis you don't get cholestasis, whereas in the acute phase you get cholestasis along with portal hypertension? Can you, can you explain that? <laughs> Thank you for that easy question, Mohammed. Uh, um, yeah, well, I've always been intrigued in the recovery phase of subacute liver failure. You get quite a large mass of apparently healthy hepatocytes that do not function in the way you'd expect from that mass of hepatocytes. And we've discussed this many times, and I, I thought it was basically about maturation arrest, but you have developed this argument that it's actually about, and it fits with what I've just been talking about is that you're actually getting a nodular uh, regeneration, and they are indeed uh, prone to cholestasis, which presumably is a reflection of function as well as, as the more. I think we do underestimate the degree of portal hypertension in subacute liver failure. So I, I think it's a combination of both. I mean, in the cirrhosis model, I think the hepatocytes remain functioning remark for a remarkably long period of time. They function well for maybe four or five years after the point of getting to complete and definitive development of cirrhosis with hypertension. And again, what I kind of didn't appreciate until I started preparing this talk is the contribution of the vascular injury in the propagation of the disease to, uh, to liver failure. Can I ask a naive question as a surgeon? <laughs> when you've got liver failure in cirrhotics, You've got a huge amount of hepatocyte mass. I know Anil can answer, Dr. Chawla can answer. Um, you've got a huge amount of hepatocyte mass, and you will see some researchers still trying hepatocytes as a treatment of these patients, and uh, as well as stem cells, which will convert to hepatocytes. We know it's never worked. What, and if, if I compare that to extra hepatic portal vein thrombosis, where there is, a, again, a huge amount of hepatocyte mass, you practically never get liver failure. You might do at one, one very late stage. Why do these cells don't, why don't they work? 
Is it because in cirrhosis there is a portal hypertension and there is damage in the sinusoids and the liver cells are damaged, whereas in the extrahepatic portal vein thrombosis, these hepatocytes are protected by the direct pressure. The pressure is in the mesenteric system, not within the liver. Do you think there is a difference there? Anybody has an answer to that? Maybe James knows the answer to that. Um, I think it comes back to understanding the, the microscopic vascular uh, injury. I'll go back to um, the chicken wire situation, the alcohol or the naffold. That situation present or leads to what we recognize very well in clinical practice is a significant um, distortion between the balance of function and portal hypertension. So we all recognize patients whose liver function tests are very good, but have very, very severe uh, portal hypertension and may need an intervention for intractable ascites. Yet the hepatocyte function itself remains very good. So you do get situations of imbalance. Um, and again, I'm saying it for the third time. I think what I'm you know, understanding it, or from this is that what we cannot assess is actually the vascular injury to the uh, hepatocytes uh, in the cirrhotic liver. And I think that probably does determine uh, the pattern of clinical manifestation of the disease. Thank you very much, John.